Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Troubleshooting Cell-Based Assays, Ask the Experts to Avoid Common Pitfalls from Cell Seeding to Analysis. I am Maggie Bach of Promega, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational webinar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Eppendorf and Promega. To learn more, visit their websites at promega.com and eppendorf.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. First, we will hear from Dr. Jessica Wagner, an Application Specialist in Cell Handling at Eppendorf, and then we will hear from Dr. Eric Monkey, an Application Specialist at Promega. Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Maggie, for the introduction, and welcome everyone also from my side, and thank you for joining our webinar today. I would like to start with showing you a very general overview of the cell culture workflow. So independent of the specific cell type or um, research you are working with, these steps shown here are part of the routine in every cell culture lab. When cells are used for an experiment, various steps can follow, including, for example, the treatment with a certain substance or other manipulation of the cells. For this webinar, Eppendorf and Promega are joining forces to share our expertise and address the most common questions regarding assay optimization and troubleshooting. We will cover the general aspects of everyday culture practices and go into the details of different assay setups. So um, here's an overview of the different topics that we will address during, during the presentation, and I will start with the more general aspects shown here on the left-hand side. So our first topic is contamination of cells, or to be more precise, the prevention of contamination. There are different types of contaminants. Some of them are very easy to, de to detect, like those shown here on the left-hand side. But there are two types of contaminants I would like to talk about here, and these are mycoplasma and cross-contaminations of eukaryotic cell lines. Mycoplasma are special types of bacteria which are too small to be seen in a standard bright field microscope. They don't cause any turbidity or color change of the culture medium like other bacteria do and are therefore often overlooked. In this graphic here on the right, you get an idea of the dramatic intracellular effects caused by a mycoplasma infection. And this brings me to our first FAQ. What is the best method to detect mycoplasma? Here you see an overview of the different methods, and as you see, all of them have advantages and disadvantages. So when choosing a method for your lab, several aspects should be considered. Do you have access to the desired equipment? How many samples do you need to test at once, and how long can you wait for getting the results? And this brings me to the next question regarding the test frequency. How often should cell cultures be tested for mycoplasma? Um, so there is no optimal test frequency that is sufficient for every lab. In general, I would always start with, a sh with shorter intervals of testing, for example, every four weeks, and then monitor the results to see if the frequency of testing is sufficient, should be increased or can be decreased without having a higher incidence of mycoplasma positive cultures. The, the level of expertise in aseptic handling in the lab is also important when choosing a test frequency. For example, are there colleagues in the lab who are not so experienced with aseptic handling of cells and equipment? And is the equipment like incubators, pipettes, and reagents shared by many people? Both would increase the risk of a mycoplasma infection. If cells are used in subsequent or long-term studies, a higher testing frequency decreases the risk that a mycoplasma infection can spread and that infected cells influence experimental outcomes. 
When a contamination with mycoplasma or any other type of contaminant goes undetected, it endangers the reliability and reproducibility of experimental data. I often receive the question if cells that are irreplaceable can be recovered from a mycoplasma infection. First of all, I would like to mention that the best way to get rid of the mycoplasma is to discard the infected cultures immediately to avoid spreading the infection. However, elimination of mycoplasma from infected cultures has been described and can be successful. When using such treatment cells, cell growth should be monitored and the cells should not be used for an experiment directly after the mycoplasma treatment. So give them time to recover from that treatment. Let's switch to another type of contamination. A misidentified cell line develops from a cross-contamination of two different cell lines. It is estimated that 15 to 20 percent of all cell lines used are either cross-contaminated or misidentified. Cross-contamination usually happens by an accident somewhere during the handling of cells, and mislabeling of samples, inconsistent nomenclature of cell lines also contribute to this phenomenon. As soon as Two cell types are mixed up, it is very hard to distinguish them. This process goes fast and it might go undetected, especially if the morphology of the cells is not drastically different. On the image shown here on the right, there are two cell types mixed together. Faster growing cell lines overgrow and replace slower growing cells, especially when cell stocks are given from lab to lab without any kind of quality control. The risk of receiving or sharing cross-contaminated or misidentified cells is present. There are several methods like karyotyping, isoenzyme profiling, and DNA barcoding available to detect interspecies cross-contamination. That means contamination of cell lines from different species. For human cell lines, identity testing can be performed using short tandem repeat or STR profiling. The analysis of short tandem repeats has become the standard for intraspecies identity testing of human cell lines. So here's an overview of the whole procedure of STR profiling. The development of markers for authentication of non-human cell lines is still an ongoing process, and more reliable polymeric STR markers, which can provide discrimination of other species than human, must be identified. At the end of our presentation, Maggie from Promega will take over again and give some insights into new solutions for STR analysis from Promega. So let's come to our next topic, everyday culture practice. The passage number of cell lines has often been described to influence cellular behavior. The passage number is a record of the number of times a cell culture has been subcultivated. There are numerous studies giving evidence that the passage number affects a cell line's characteristics over time. It has been described that cell lines at high passage number experience alterations in morphology, response to stimuli, growth rates, protein expression, transfection, transfection efficacy, and more. So in general, we can say, keep the passage number as low as possible. A lot of the well-established and well-characterized cell lines that are used in labs worldwide have been isolated from their original tissue decades ago. So when you work with such an old cell line, it is most likely not possible to obtain early passages from this cell line but you must set a starting point as a reference to be able to obtain reliable results with these cells. The starting point should be cells of high quality. The best way to ensure this high quality is obtaining cells from one of the established cell banks. Here you get well-documented, authenticated cell lines, which can serve as the best reference cultures for your experiments. A very simple measure is to not keep cells in culture that are not actively used for experiments. So don't passage continuously, but rather establish new cells from frozen stocks if required. Establishing a cell profile, like shown here, with all required information of a cell line is a good measure to keep an eye on any unexpected changes of the cells, which might be a hint for cell senescence or overpassaging. Okay, so the next FAQ is if passaging can have an impact on any experimental results. So no matter what you do with a cell culture, freezing, subculturing, or seeding cells for an experiment, it is important to determine the right time point for a particular cell type. In this graphic, you see a typical growth curve of adherent cells in culture. 
And it is important to not let the cells overgrow until they are in the stationary phase and do not proliferate anymore. The optimal time point is when the cells are in their exponential growth phase, also called log phase. And this is when they are between 70 and 80 percent confluent. When you use trypsin for cell detachment, it is important to know that trypsin can be harmful to the cells. So incubation of the cells with trypsin should not be too long. On the other hand, trypsin loses its activity over time when stored for too long uh, at 4 degrees Celsius. So working aliquots should not be stored in the fridge for longer than two weeks. Documenting cell viability during routine culture can help to avoid that non-optimal cultures are used for experiments. So <clears throat> when the viability of a culture drops below 80%, I would recommend initiating new cultures from frozen stock. When we are talking about cell maintenance and everyday routine culture practice, the CO2 incubator also plays an important role. Every time the door of the incubator is opened, the atmosphere inside gets disturbed. disturbed. Temperature, humidity, and CO2 level all have an influence on the cells. It is a good advice to reduce the traffic in and out of the incubator as much as possible. Only open the door when necessary and close it as soon as possible. An incubator with split inner doors, like shown here on the lower right, helps to keep the atmosphere stable simply because the area that is opened is smaller. When closing the outer door again, the recovery of temperature and CO2 should be quick and without any overshoot of temperature, which can be harmful to the cells. In this graphic here, you see the recovery curves for CO2 and temperature in the Appendorf Cell Expert incubator. Here, both parameters reach their set point again in less than five minutes after a door opening. We often receive the question if it makes any difference if plates are placed on different shelves in the incubator or if they are incubated in the back of the shelf or in the front right behind the door. When your incubator has a fan inside, this can be a source of vibration which might influence the cells. When you look at these images where we measure temperature homogeneity in different incubators, you see that some models indeed show quite high variety of temperature depending on the position of the shelf and the location on the shelf. Especially at the darker red spots shown here, the cells would be exposed to non-optimal temperatures. A performance check using external temperature probes can reveal if the incubators in your lab show deviations in temperature that are critical for the cells. Organizing the shelves, for example, like shown here, can help to reduce the duration of door openings because it is easier to spot the right culture vessel when the shelves are organized. So this next FAQ would also fit to the first topic of contamination prevention. However, checking the water in your incubator should be part of the lab routine during the week. To avoid corrosion of the water tray, only distilled water should be used. We recommend replacing the water every week by emptying the tray completely and cleaning it with alcohol before adding fresh water. Adding any biocides should be considered carefully because these substances might also cause corrosion. In addition, there is a risk that the biocides contain volatile compounds that can have cytotoxic effects when the water is evaporating in the incubator. Some incubators come with a UV lamp inside, which is supposed to decontaminate the circulated air. Before you consider paying for such a feature, please keep in mind that the high humidity inside the incubator adversely impacts the effectiveness of UV. So it might not be worth to spend the money, especially as it means recurring costs, because the UV bulb has a limited runtime. I'm sorry, I forgot to click to the next question, uh, to the next slide. Um, okay, so here's our next topic, cryopreservation. Having high quality cell stock is your backup system and the prerequisite for reliable research. A two-stage cell banking system with a master and a working stock provides you constantly with early passages from your cell lines. Measures for quality control should be established for frozen stocks. Thus, you make sure that you don't freeze contaminated cells and that the cell line is really the cell line you think it is. So authentication of cell lines should be performed regularly, especially when you got the cells from another lab and when you use them in long-term or subsequent studies. 
The routine use of antibiotics is not recommended because they can mask a contamination with partially resistant bacteria. A detailed record of the cell stocks is as important as clear labeling of cryotubes, of course. As the handling of liquid nitrogen is not very convenient in contrast to a freezer, a frequent question is if minus 80 degrees is sufficient for long-term storage of mammalian cells. Even if some cells survive storage at, at minus 80, the lower the storage temperature, the longer the period that cell stocks can be stored without losing viability. Placing cell stocks in a minus 80 freezer should only be done short term, for example, as part of a controlled freezing process before the cells are transferred to their final storage repository. A slow cooling rate and the addition of cryoprotectants such as DMSO prevents the formation of ice crystals. When we look at the thawing process, a common question is if the cell suspensions need to be centrifuged after thawing to get rid of the DMSO, which is cytotoxic to a certain degree. In general, there are two ways of handling freshly thawed cell suspensions. You can either thaw and discard the DMSO containing supernatant. The other way is to dilute the cells with fresh medium until the suspension has a final concentration of 1% DMSO. Some cells react more sensitive to the centrifugation step right after thawing. Other cells might react more sensitive to even low concentration of DMSO. A medium exchange the day after thawing is recommended with both procedures to remove any dead cells or debris from the culture. And our next topic is the handling of liquids in cell culture. In this graph, you see the results of a cell viability assay. Each column represents one row of a 96-well plate, and the aim was to simply seed an identical number of cells in each well. After 24 hours, the number of viable cells was determined using a colorimetric assay. And the only difference between the first five columns and the other ones is the pipetting technique. In this graph, you see, um, uh, sorry, and this already is the answer to our next FAQ. So yes, the way you handle your pipette does have an influence on the precision of volumes you are pipetting. Pipetting of liquids in cell culture is always the balance between being precise and keeping the contamination risk low. Here on the left, you see the optimal technique for precise volume, so holding the pipette vertical and keeping a constant immersion depth during aspiration. And then when the liquid is released, you can hold the pipette in a 45 degree angle to avoid that your arm is directly or your hand is directly above the open culture vessel. And with this, I will hand over to Eric again, who will dive into the details of different essay setups and answer the most common questions regarding the topics shown here on the right. Okay, um, thank you, Jessica, and welcome everyone. In this next section of the webinar, we are gonna focus on the last part of the workflow that Jessica presented earlier, so where we use cells in an experimental setting, a so-called cell-based assay. And also for this part, we actually received numerous questions over the past years that we worked up and that we kind of grouped into distinct subject areas. And today we're gonna to look at some of these areas. So the first area that I would like to talk about is the assay detection mode. And here we received questions such as, are absorbance-based assays compatible with multiplexing? What is the benefit of bioluminescence when compared to fluorescence? And finally, what detection mode do you recommend for HTS or high throughput screening? To address these questions, I would like to briefly highlight the principles and features of the different detection modes. In an absorbance-based assay, you have an external light source that sends light through a sample. And what you basically do is to detect the decrease in light intensity due to partial absorbance of light by components within that sample. Absorbance-based assays are usually the least sensitive ones. They suffer from a low signal to background ratio and a low dynamic range. 
these parameters are kind of improved in a fluorescence-based assay setup where, again, you have an external light source that excites a given fluorophore within the sample and you detect the emission of light at a longer wavelength. What I really would like to convey, and this is probably also the reason why we at Promega have a major focus on bioluminescent technologies, is that the third option, the bioluminescence-based assay, will generally grant the highest sensitivity. In such an assay, you have the signal generated directly within the sample in a continuously occurring chemical re reaction. So this means there is no need for an external light source, which allows us to massively diminish any background. Background, however, in a fluorescence-based assay can actually make up a considerable part of the signal due to a phenomenon known as autofluorescence. Although at the first glance, absorbance-based assays appear to be the least expensive one, once a major drawback of these assays is in fact that they in general cannot be combined with other assays, they cannot be multiplexed. However, a fluorescence and a bioluminescence-based assay can be ideally partnered for multiplexing. So what does the difference in sensitivity of the various detection modes now mean with regard to the absolute cell number required in an assay, because this is an important parameter when it comes to compatibility with assay miniaturization and HDS. To illustrate this, I would like to compare three of our cell viability assays. First of all, the cell titer 96, which is an absorbance-based assay that requires a minimum of around 1,000 cells per 96 well in order to generate a signal that you can easily distinguish from the assay background. This goes down to 400 cells per 96 well with the fluorescent cell titer blue assay. And finally, the bioluminescent cell titer glow assay can detect as few as 10 cells per 96 well. So, this shows you among these assays, it's clearly the one with the highest sensitivity and therefore most applicable or most suitable for applications where you work with small cell numbers. This brings me to the second subject area that I would like to touch on today, which is the selection of the assay plate type. And here we received questions in the vein of which type of plate is compatible with my assay? Can you give some guidance on the selection of plates? And how does my plate actually contribute to the variation of an assay? For every cell-based assay, you would want that plate to be sterile and to have a lid to allow for incubation. And if you work with adherent cells, it should also be tissue culture treated or TC treated. You can then choose from clear black and white plates. The black and white ones are available in different formats, a solid and a clear bottom format. For an absorbance-based assay, you definitely will go for the clear plate. And depending on what region of the spectrum you're looking at, you can choose from different materials. The most important thing is that you must never use this plate type for a luminescence-based assay. And I think this is pretty conceivable if you remember that we have this continuous light production that goes on in the wells of the plates. And in a clear plate, this light can surely go anywhere. So you simple, simply cannot track it down to a distinct well within the plate. The primary choice for the fluorescence-based assay is the black plate. Here, a black pigment is added to the plastic in order to decrease the autofluorescence of the plastic, meaning the background caused by the plate itself. And finally, the primary choice for the luminescence-based assay is the white plate. Here, a brightener is added to the plastic to improve the reflective properties of these plates so that, in fact, a maximum of your signal will be reflected towards the detector. If you work with white plates, you should be aware of what is known as phosphorescence, because white plates themselves, they can absorb and emit photons. This is why we recommend you to 
store these plates in a dark space. And if you do pipette them, do this in a sort of dimmed environment, or at least once you've inserted the plate into your reading instrument, Give it a few minutes time in the dark before you run your measurement because this will allow for the phosphorescent signal to disappear. Inevitably linked to data variability in a plate-based assay is the so-called edge effect. This effect mainly affects the outer walls of a microtiter plate and is negatively correlated with the working volume. This is the reason why you mainly observe this effect with 96 well plates and higher density formats. Furthermore, this edge effect is positively correlated with the incubation time, meaning the longer you incubate your cells, the more pronounced an edge effect may become. The edge effect becomes apparent actually at two different levels. First of all, we have a higher degree of evaporation in the outer wells when compared to the inner wells. And this leads to an increase in osmolarity due to concentration of salts and solutes that are within the medium. And eventually this can not only significantly affect the cellular growth, but also decrease the cellular viability so that in the end, you end up with a gradient of differing cell number across the plate. Strategies to tackle the edge effect involve the use of specialized plates or specialized plate seals, gas permeable plate seals that allow for culturing of cells. And if none of these solutions is available, you can also omit to use the outer wells for your samples, so only use the inner inner wells for your samples, but fill the outer wells with pre-equilibrated sterile liquid. This could be PBS, medium, or water. And maybe you can also fill the interwell spaces with that liquid just to um, provide some additional um, insulation for the inner sample wells. The downside of this approach, of course, is uh, that it decreases the total number of samples that you can assay per plate. The second level that the edge effect becomes apparent on is a temperature effect. So in, it is easy to imagine that the outer wells of such a plate will respond much more sensitive towards changes in temperature than the inner wells. And a scenario where we observe this a lot is the shuttling off the plate between the incubator and the reading instrument. So it is advisable when you have to do plate shuttling to hurry up and if possible to completely avoid plate shuttling by using the plate, uh, plate reader as an incubator. In particular, if you run enzymatic assays, this has to be seen critical because even small changes in the temperature can lead to a severe change in the enzymatic activity, which in the end translates into a high intraassay variation. So it is important to really try to keep the temperature as constant as possible over time, meaning pre-equilibrate all the reagents that you use as well as the reading instrument to the temperature that you would like to run the measurement at. Here we compared two different strategies to counteract the edge effect. First of all, we used a gas permeable plate seal and then the second strategy is the use of a lid, whereas in this case, we only use the inner 60 wells for the samples, whereas the outer wells were just filled with pre-equilibrated liquid. All wells of these two plates were filled with 100 microliters of liquid, and then the plates were incubated for 24 hours at 37 degrees Celsius, either in a humidified incubator or in a non-humidified atmosphere as you will find it in your reading instrument. We then average the residual volume of four inner and four outer wells, and these are the results we obtained. If you look at the condition where the lid was used, you can nicely see the pronounced edge effect, meaning a higher degree of evaporation in the outer wells in red when compared to the inner wells in green. And this effect is nicely alleviated using the gas permeable plate seal. 
However, if you can spare to use the outer wells for your samples, then a lid seems to be an excellent strategy too, especially if we're looking at the uh, condition where we use the non-humidified plate reader on the right-hand side, you can see that the lid really seems to ensure a relatively low degree of evaporation of the inner sample wells. This brings me to the next subject area that I would like to talk a little bit about, um, which is assay selection. And in fact, the majority of questions we received here were about viability assays, which is not too surprising considering the fact that cell viability is probably among the most widely determined parameters using cell-based assays. Interestingly, many of these questions were also dealing with a particular viability assay, the so-called MTT assay, which is why I would like to focus on this assay a little bit as well. So questions we received were, my lab uses MTT. How does this compare to bioluminescent viability assays? Can I increase the incubation time of my MTT assay to improve sensitivity? And finally, what are limitations of the MTT assay? To address these questions, I would like to present three assays that are all based on reduction equivalence as a readout for cellular viability. The first assay shown here is the MTT assay, or as we call it, the cell titer 96 non-radioactive cell proliferation assay. This assay, the MTT assay, is actually considered to be one of the first non-radioactive plate-based viability assays. It was developed back in the early 1980s, and the principle is relatively easy. This assay is based on a tetrasolium dye called MTT, which is cell permeable and thus intracellularly reduced to an insoluble formicin product. And in order to read absorbance, this insoluble product needs to be solubilized first, which renders this assay to be a lytic endpoint assay, because this assay requires the addition of a solubilization solution, which typically is DMSO. A more advanced version of this assay is the MTS assay, or cell titer 96 aqueous. MTS has a negative charge, so it doesn't get into the cell, which is the reason why this assay requires an additional component, a so-called electron transfer reagent, or ETR, which is the component that picks up the electrons at the level of the cellular membrane and shuttles these electrons onto MTS, which is subsequently reduced to form a soluble pharmacin product. So the major difference here is that in contrast to the MTT assay, this is a live cell assay that you can read from the cell culture supernatant. And the beauty is that this assay preserves the cells to, for any other downstream application. So you can, for example, use the cells to isolate RNA um, and run a QRT PCR afterwards or whatever. The third assay, the cell titer blue assay, is based on the intracellular reduction of resazerine into resorophene, and resorophene is a fluorescent product that you can quantify. So what all these three assays have in common besides being based on reduction equivalence is that they all measure an accumulated product. And hence, they all do require extensive incubation of the cells with the assay reagent, typically one to four hours. Although these three assays are great assays, when using them, it is really important that you are aware of their limitations. And one of them is clearly the sensitivity. There are strategies to improve sensitivity and signal to background ratio. For example, you can go for distinct plate types or you um, can increase the cell number, which of course does only make sense to a certain degree. But then people also do increase the concentration of the assay reagent or they prolong the incubation time. And these two last bullet points highlighted in red have really to be seen critical because 
Nowadays, we know that tetrasolium dye and resazarine-based assay chemistries can itself be actually toxic to cells. And this is exemplified by these two um, images down below where you can see a four-hour incubation of cells with either MTT on the left-hand side and resazarine on the right-hand side. And you can see that this incubation leads to severe morphological changes of these cells. Actually, this toxicity is not too surprising if you consider what these assay do. They do deprive the cells of their reducing potential. And of course, this is critically needed to maintain normal cellular function. So whenever you use these assays, it is important that with your particular model system to check for this potential toxicity effect, simply to prevent that this effect artificially influences your data. Our gold standard assay for cell viability is the cell titer glow assay. This is a bioluminescent lytic endpoint assay that quantifies the amount of ATP in your sample using the ATP dependent firefly luciferase reaction. And as I pointed out earlier, this assay is highly sensitive. It can detect as few as 10 cells per 96 well, making it ideally suited to be used for assay miniaturization and HTS. In contrast to the three assays that are presented on the previous slides, this assay does not require extensive incubation of the cells with the assay reagent. So only a 10 minute incubation step is needed. The assay is based on a single reagent that you add to the cells and which contains all the required components of the firefly luciferase reaction, except for the crucial cofactor ATP. Additionally, this reagent contains a lytic component that when added to the cells will lyse the cells and release the cellular ATP, which can now fuel the firefly reaction. So in the end, light output will positively correlate with the amount of ATP being present in your sample, and you can therefore conclude on the viability of your cells. This brings me to the next subject area that I would like to touch on today, which is quality, variability, and reproducibility of data. And questions we received here were all in the vein of how can I decrease the variability of my assay, how can I increase the reproducibility of my assay, and how does the actual handling of my cells can have an effect on my assay results. Whenever you establish a cell-based assay yourself, you should always make sure to keep the total number of steps required to run the assay as low as possible, because every step you add is a potential source of variation. This exactly is the reason why Promega assays follow this common principle, the so-called add, mix, and measure principle. So typically our assays are based on a single reagent that you only need to add to the cells, you briefly mix, and then you can read the signal. Our assays are also considered to be homogeneous, which means they do only require addition steps. So typically no Cell washing is required or removal of supernatants, which renders these assays also HTS compatible and furthermore makes them very easy to automate. But on the other hand, the fewer pipetting steps, of course, are what makes these assays more time saving and more easier for you as the operator to actually perform the assay. In every cell based assay, the cells themselves are a considerable source of variability. And today I would like to talk a little bit about the effect of the cellular density. I think it's conceivable that if you seed cells at different density and you treat them with a given concentration of a toxic compound, that these cells might behave differently towards that treatment. However, it is not as conceivable that also the seeding density in your stock culture can actually affect your downstream analysis. This is nicely illustrated by the experiment here where we uh, grew 
HL60 cells to different uh, densities, low, medium, and high. We then harvested these cells and seeded them at an equal density in a microtiter plate. We then ran a cytotoxic treatment and assayed two different parameters, ATP content and caspase 3.7 activity. What you can nicely see is that there is a clear difference in how these cells respond towards the treatment with that cytotoxic substance called vinblastin. So in fact, the cells derived from the low density stock culture appear to respond much more sensitive towards that treatment than the others. This makes this a perfect example to illustrate how important it is to agree on different standard operating procedures in your cell culture simply to make sure that you always work with fixed time points when you harvest or seed your cells, fixed cell numbers, simply to eliminate this uh, potential source of uh, variation. Another great means to improve data quality and also reliability is to maximize the amount of data that you can get from a sim single sample using assay multiplexing. Multiplexing means that you determine two or even more parameters using one and the same sample, typically by sequentially running assays on that particular sample. In order to do so, these assays, of course, need to fulfill certain requirements. They need to be biologically and chemically compatible. Um, furthermore, these assays, of course, need to generate signals that you can easily distinguish from one another. And in the end, the now higher end volume needs to fit with your selected plate format. Nevertheless, when all these requirements are met, then multiplexing can be really advantageous because it allows you to generate two or more data sets using one and the same sample, which at the same time means you maintain the same variables. And furthermore, it's a very cost-effective and convenient way of data verification and normalization. This brings me to the last subject area that I would like to touch on today, which is about assay timing. And here I will exclusively focus on the timing of cytotoxicity assays, because this is where we received most uh, questions for. Questions were, for example, can you give advice on the length of incubation with drugs before assaying cytotoxicity? How does the incubation time between uh, vary between adherent cell lines and cells grown in 3D, for example, spheroids? And how do I approach a cytotoxicity assay for an unknown compound? The answer is that this is really dependent on your particular experiment. So it's dependent on the particular model system you use, your compound, the compound concentration, so many, many factors. Taken together, there is no general answer to this. And unless you don't have any guidance from the literature, this is really something that you will have to determine empirically from scratch. The good news, however, is that there are means that can really make your life much easier. Why is it so challenging to time a cytotoxicity assay? The reason is that cytotoxicity markers have their own time-dependent profile when they appear and when they disappear again. And furthermore, there are markers that are really specific to a certain type of cell death. For example, caspase activation you can only measure in apoptotic cells, but not in necrotic cells. If we look at the release of lactate dehydrogenase into the cell culture supernatant, this is a rather early event in necrotic cells, but a late event in apoptotic cells, actually when these cells turn into secondary necrosis. And finally, if we look at the decline in ATP levels, uh, these, this process occurs very rapidly in necrotic cells, but much, much more modestly in apoptotic cells. 
if you use an activity-based biomarker, meaning an enzyme, then you also have to take into account that this biomarker, this enzyme can undergo degradation or inactivation processes so that in the end, you might run into the problem to actually underestimate your cytotoxicity or to completely miss the cytotoxic event that you seek to measure. So a good strategy to overcome these challenges of endpoint assays is actually to at least in the first place, rely on assays that support time course analysis in real time, because with these assays, you can cover a wide time window and then easily identify the time points that you may want to look at more closely in the future with an endpoint assay. A nice example for such an assay is the so-called cell tox green cytotoxicity assay. This assay is based on a fluorescent DNA binding dye that is cell impermeable, so it's excluded from viable cells. However, if the cells lose their membrane integrity, it can enter the cell and bind to DNA and yields a fluorescent signal. This assay has been validated for time course analysis of up to 72 hours. So if you want to, you can cover a three-day period using this assay, which makes it ideal to identify cytotoxic events that you might be looking for. If we look at our fluorescent assay portfolio, it is also probably the assay that we multiplex the most with the assays of our bioluminescent assay portfolio. And what I also would like to mention is that besides the benefits of identifying the correct or appropriate time point, these real-time assays also have um, other advantages with regard uh, to economic, um, uh, economical, um, from an economic standpoint of view because with these assets, you can really save material and time. So if we look at an example where we would use or run a 72 hour time course experiment with a data point recorded every hour, meaning 72 data points in total, with an endpoint assay, this would require you to use 72 micro titer plates, 72 times medium cells and reagent. And you can actually gather the same amount of information from a single plate, single time medium cells and reagent uh, with a real time assay. And with this, I would like to close and uh, thank you for your attention. And I would like to hand over to Maggie. OK, thank you, Eric and Jessica, for your informative presentations. And before we get into the Q&A session, we want to briefly introduce the Spectrum Compact CE system from Promega. This system is an affordable benchtop instrument for Sanger sequencing and fragment analysis. As Jessica mentioned, it can be used to perform STR profiling, which is so important in your routine cell culture, right in your own laboratory. The instrument is designed for use with existing sequencing chemistries using fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotide triphosphate and 4, 5, and 6 dye STR kits from Promega and others. The flexible run scheduling and small batch processing means that you'll never have to wait to batch samples or depend on outsourcing your sequencing. If you would like additional information, including information on installation and training, please visit the URL shown on your screen. And now we will start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. I see that a few have been submitted, but you're welcome to submit more as we go along. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. We'll get started here. And our first question here is for Eric. Eric, what happens if I use a black plate for luminescence and a white plate for fluorescent measurements? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a good question indeed. And in fact, um, if you remember the slide where I had um, the, the different plate types on, I had a yes in bracket uh, 
for um, using a black plate for a luminescence-based assay and a white plate for a fluorescence-based assay, which means that in principle, you can do this, so this works. Um, you just have to be aware of the consequences, uh, which is that using a black plate for a luminescence-based assay will give you lower absolute signal intensities, which can make up yeah, to about one order of magnitude lower, um, simply because you miss the reflective properties of the white plates. And conversely, if you use a white plate for a fluorescence-based assay, you will yield much higher signal intensities. But the relative contribution of the background in this higher signal um, is also increased. So you will have higher background because you miss um, the decreasing effect of the, the black pigment onto, uh, on the autofluorescence of the, the plastic. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, we have another question here for Jessica. Jessica, would you recommend or discourage using a mycoplasma elimination kit? Um, in general, I would always try to avoid using such a kit and rather discard the infected cultures because as I have mentioned, um, the risk that you spread the infection um, is rather high and it is also um, possible that the cells um, um, suffer from that mycoplasma um, elimination treatment. However, as I said, if the cells are irreplaceable, you can try um, to, um, to use those kits. There are also other strategies like using different high concentrated antibiotics um, but, um, yeah, in general, um, it is always a question if it's really needed or if you, um, if you have, uh, or if you can, can, uh, if you have access to new, um, cell stocks. So, um, there are also services available. So I know that there are a few cell banks, um, that are offering, um, yeah, basically mycoplasma elimination service. So you can send them their culture and they will do the treatment for you. So maybe that is also an option for very valuable cell types or cell lines. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Those are some good options for people out there. Uh, we have a few questions coming in here about the edge effect. So this looks like it was a popular topic. Um, one question here, is it negative to stack up 96 well plates in the incubator? Uh, does that impact the edge effect at all? This is actually a very interesting question. So as far as I know, we couldn't show um, an effect of stacked plates versus non-stacked plates. However, the edge effect itself is not a very stable phenomenon, so it's not so easy to reproduce um, when you only look at a simple um, readout, let's say if you only look at cell growth um, or, or cell distribution on the plate, it is not so easy to, re, uh, easy to reproduce. So we didn't find a direct correlation um, of stacking the plates and the, uh, and the edge effect. However, it will also depend on the, um, on the specific plate you are using because the, the, um, they differ. Um, in the details from manufacturers to, man to manufacturers, so some of them have little so-called ventilation gaps so that the air can, um, can also go through the stack of plates, so there the edge effect will be, um, will be less pronounced. But, um, yeah, so in the end, um, it's more or less a philosophical question if you want to stack plates or if you have to stack plates in the incubator um, because you need the space for other vessels. So... Um, I would say if you can avoid to stack the plates, then put them side by side. But if you cannot avoid it, um, then um, yeah, then the 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 effect um, is not easy to to reproduce. I would say. Okay, interesting, and that is interesting that that's something you have looked at. Um, all these different variables uh, that go into our cell-based assays here. Okay, we have quite a few questions coming in. This one looks like it's for Eric. Um, Eric, we perform ADCC assays using the Cytotox 96 uh, kit to detect absorbance in our lab. Is there any more sensitive detection method for ADCC assays? Um, well, in fact, um, there 
are some other options that uh, we we developed, which I did not touch on today. Um, there, uh, we do have um, some uh, assays for target cell killing um, to look at ADCC in particular, um, which are based um, also on the split variant of one of our luciferases. Um, so if that's of interest for you, uh, feel free to, to drop me an email um, and I can provide you with the information on that. Thank you. Um, also, I believe um, similar to viability assays where we have colorimetric and bioluminescent versions, there are LDH detection assays with both colorimetric and bioluminescent versions. Correct. Um, so yeah. that may be an option as well. Okay, uh, it looks like we have another question here for Jessica about um, incubators. So their incubator has a fan inside it. Is there a need or how can you protect cells from the vibrations caused by that fan inside? Um, there are some incubator models on the market that have fans and some that don't have fans. So if you have a fan with an incubator, then this fan is is needed in the incubator because um, there are different heating technologies to incubators and um, some of them require a fan to distribute the air and also um, to recover the atmosphere after a door opening. So if you have such an incubator with a fan, then you cannot disassemble the fan, for instance, to avoid the vibration completely. Um, so the only option you have is to first spot the fan, where is it located inside the incubator chamber, and then try to locate your assay plate or any sensitive cells as far from the fan as possible. So um, to have the, the, um, yeah, the lowest vibration that is possible. But as I said, you, you cannot really avoid it. So every time you open and close the door again, the fan will be switched on for a few seconds to recover um, the atmosphere and to distribute the air um, throughout the chamber, so um, the only option to avoid it completely would be um, to purchase an incubator without a fan um, with a heating te technology that does not require ventilated air. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Uh, we're getting near the top of the hour, so it looks like we have time for just one more question um, for each. Um, Eric, we have an additional question here for plate types. Do you have a recommendation for a plate type to use when multiplexing the fluorescent and luminescent assays? Um, well, yeah, exactly. This is the, the situation where, of course, obviously you have to make a choice. Um, and in general, you would um, choose a plate that supports detection of the weakest signal best. Um, so if you expect that your luminescent signal will be the weakest signal that you would go for the white plate, if that's the fluorescent signal, then you probably would go for, for the black plate. Okay, thank you. And uh, quickly for Jessica, we have another question here about related to the edge effect. Uh, so is it advisable to fill the outer wells of a 96 well plate with medium? Um, as Eric already pointed out, you can basically use every sterile liquid that is pre-warmed to the, to the desired temperature um, to insulate the inner well. So it can be medium, it can be sterile water, it can be PBS. We even tried it out with um, using agarose uh, in, the, in the outer well. So it is basically just an insulation. So I would not go for the medium simply because of cost reasons. I would choose a... a a lower cost liquid like PBS or, or simply sterile water here. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, thank you both of you, Jessica and Eric, for your time today and all the information presented. Uh, we would also like to thank LabRoots and the sponsors, Promega and Eppendorf, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today and for your interesting questions. Anything that we did not have time for and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay.
We encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. And until next time, thank you and goodbye.